down so you can see my face. help if I turned it on, huh? <laughs> well, good morning. Good morning. This morning, um, basically what I'm going to be sharing is a personal testimony of Thanksgiving, and appropriately so, being this is Thanksgiving week, and um, I, my heart is full. As, let me just say that. My heart is full with Thanksgiving and gratitude, and um, I've encouraged you in the past, and uh, I know it works because I practice it, is no matter what we're walking through, there's always, if we practice the attitude of gratitude, we will have a thankful heart. And so each day, you know, it's my practice to be thankful. And I want to say Thanksgiving this morning because Karen Redmond came in. And uh, I'm just so grateful that you're with us, honey. It's been a long haul since she's been recovering. Blessings. Her and Julia and Kevin, we've missed you guys. We've really missed you guys. But our prayers have been with you. Thank you. Thank you for all your prayers. And um, keep Vicki in your prayers. She took a bad fall and was in the hospital. She's home now, but she's not with us this morning, and she does need our prayers. So please pray for her. Um, this morning, I'm going to share more of a testimony than an actual teaching, but it leads into a teaching, and I, it's a pretty profound teaching, at least I found it profound, when I got the revelation on it. And so I hope it, it strikes you with the same kind of power it struck my heart, because it became a preceding word that gave me the victory that I want to share with you today. Um, last year, a year ago, October, many of you, most of you actually, have seen the video of when I went to um, the Open Heavens Conference and received that three-minute word um, through Sean Boltz that, for me, was life-changing. I didn't know it at the time that it would be life-changing or that it would impact me as deeply as it did, but because I've listened to it and watched it over and over and I've actually transcribed it and I read it every morning, um, it's become embedded in me as a promise from the Lord. It spoke not only, most of you have heard it and seen it, but it, it encouraged me. I didn't even know I needed encouragement. Have you ever been in a place where you didn't know you needed to be encouraged? You thought you were in a pretty good place, and yet when the encouragement came, it was like it just made you cry because you didn't even know how much you needed to be encouraged. And in this particular word that I received, it regarded my children, my ministry, and uh, the future of what God has in store for me. And so it's been a, um, a, a thing in my life that has been wonderful. But at the same time, when I came back from that conference last October, we decided to put that conference on for Saturday workshops for our people that wanted to come and see it. So we put on two Saturday workshops, and at those Saturday workshops, um, some of you came to that and were really blessed. And there's a, one particular person that came that is part of this testimony, and she's here today, and that's Chris McCormick. Would you raise your hand, Chris? She came to that conference, and Chris, I'll, I'll get to why she's so important in this testimony, but um, most of you know, uh, because you've known me for a long time, most of you, that I've suffered with chronic back pain for more than 20 years, probably about 25 years of chronic back pain that was bad enough that it required some form of pain medication to be able to even be functional. It didn't start out with heavy pain meds. It started out with low-level pain meds years ago. But as the years progressed, um, where this testimony starts is I was, have been, and have been for a number of years now, been on oxycodone for two, four times a day, 10 milligrams, and hated being on it, didn't like the way it made me feel, wanted no part of it, felt conflicted inside because I'm a person that <laughs> came out of a, uh, an alcoholic background and have been used in helping others all my Christian walk. And so there, this is no news. Most of the church knows this. They knew it at, at, at Celebrate Recovery and, and on Tuesday nights when I would share. They knew that I had this going on, and uh, I was not silent about it. I wasn't ashamed of it. And at no time did I ever feel guilty about taking it because I never abused it. 
Uh, it was for legitimate pain. Um, I really couldn't function without it. And so I'm, I'm, this is not to shame anyone that's on pain medicine. Please believe me that. But up until God put his finger on it. Okay? When God puts his finger on something, then that's time to deal with it. But up to that time, I had felt no conviction over it. I just didn't like being on it because it depresses everything. You know, motions, your bowels, everything. It's just not fun to be on pain meds. But anyway, um, I met Christine. I hadn't seen her in years. I knew her, but I hadn't seen her in years at the workshop. This was in November of last year. And she was telling me about some treatments that she'd been taking. But we didn't have time to discuss it. It sounded intriguing, but we didn't have time to discuss it. Long story short, I met her in Costco one day. And we stood in the aisle and must have talked for over an hour while she explained to me what counter strain was. And if anyone wants to know any more about that, you can talk to me or Chris. But anyway, this particular um, treatment she had, had found so much help with, the fellow who does the treatment is up in Portland, Oregon. And so it seemed far removed. But part of me, I'd tried so many things over the year to get help with my, uh, with my back issues. And um, I thought, you know, I talked to my husband, and he said, well, why don't you go? Why don't you go? And Chris had told me, if you're going to go, since you're coming that far, make a three-hour appointment one day and a three-hour appointment the next day. So that's what I did. So um, I couldn't get in. This fellow is very difficult to get into. I couldn't get into. It ended up being July of this year that I finally saw him for the first time. And so uh, when I went up to see him in July, I had the six hours of treatment. When I got off his table, I was standing straight, which my posture is, most of you recognize, I've had slumped shoulders. That's been my posture. But he said because my pelvic was tipped and, and I was out of alignment so badly that there's no way I could have stood up straight had I even tried. So anyway, my pos I noticed my posture was improved, but I also noticed the chronic pain area was gone. I mean, gone. It was gone. So... Um, then I really began to um, resent being on these pain meds, wanted off of them completely. It's like, I don't have a reason to be on them now. I don't want to be on them. But as you know, if you've been on a pain med for a very long time, you're going to go through withdrawals to get off of them. So I started trying to wean myself off just a little bit at a time. But I wasn't successful because I'd start getting such withdrawal symptoms that I'd go back to the full dose. And so from July until October, I went to the Open Heavens Conference again, took many of you with me. And at the Open Heavens Conference, John Bevere gave a, a challenging message, but one of the best I've ever heard. And at this, it was like God took his finger and he put his finger on it. He said, now is the time. It's time. And you know, when God puts his finger on something, he's looking for what? What is he looking for? Looking for change. Obedience, that's the word I was looking for. He's looking for obedience. And so I came back on a Saturday from that conference. I came to church on Sunday morning. I was under this constant, this feeling in my heart that I've got to yield this to God. I don't know how, but I've got to. So Monday morning, 4 in the morning, as most of you know, I'm an early person, and I get up early, and at 4 in the morning, I took my last pill. That morning... I opened my Bible where my ribbon was to continue reading the next chapter. I opened the Bible, and this is what I read. Okay, if you'll turn in your Bibles, if you like, and read along with me. It's in Mark 10, starting in verse 46. It's a very familiar story. Most of us know it, have read it many, many times over and think we know everything in it until I read it this time. That morning, it says, it's the healing of blind Bartimaeus. It says, then they came to Jericho, and as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great number of people, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat along the way begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many ordered him to keep, keep silent, but he cried out even more, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many ordered him to keep silent, but he cried out even more, 
Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. So they called and the blind man, saying, Be of good comfort. Rise. He's calling you. Throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. Jesus answered him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabbi, that I might receive my sight. Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus on the way. Okay. All right. This time, something different jumped out at me in this scripture. I'd read it many, many times. But that morning, Monday morning after the conference, October 9th, at 4 in the morning when I read this, I was reminded of something I'd heard on a teaching just before I left to the conference. I didn't remember exactly where it was in the Bible, but the man on the teaching, I don't even remember which teacher it is, but I listen to so many teaching tapes when I'm in the car. And before I'd left, right before the conference the day before, I was running errands, and as you, you know, you're listening to teachings or you're listening to music, whatever you do in the car, but I always listen to teachings, and I was listening, and this fellow was, was talking about this story. And he said when he cast aside a garment, when he, the garment he wore was, if you, if you study the history of the times, that garment was issued by the government to people who had legitimate handicap needs so that people would recognize they were worthy of alms. And so that was his livelihood. That was the very thing. That's how he lived. And it was, it was given as a sign to people that he was truly worthy to receive. And so when I, I was like, wonder where that is. And that morning, this is just how the Lord, you know, when God is on our trying to give us, this is the kind of the way the Lord works with me anyway. So anyway, when I came back from the conference, I'm going, I wonder where that is in the scripture. I couldn't quite remember that morning I was asking him. And when I pulled this string and it opened to that passage, my heart just started pounding. With that little piece of information, when I read this this time, uh, it spoke to me differently than it had. It says, throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. Throw it aside. God was speaking to me about what I needed to throw aside. What do you think it was? Those pain pills, right? I had a, almost a whole full bottle. I had just spelled it before I went to the conference. That morning, I crushed him. I flushed him down the toilet. I thought, if I couldn't even go off, <laughs> it's like, okay, this was to me, and Roxanne said it at prayer group uh, that afternoon. She said it was a preceding word, and I'd never heard that expression. And I thought, yeah, because I would never have had the courage to do that had it not been the Lord put his finger on it and said, cast it aside. But see, when you get to the end of the story, when Jesus tells him, your faith has made you whole, what was he saying? Because you, you acted on your faith before you got to me, immediately he was ready to heal him. Do you see that? Faith takes action. Okay. You get a word. Okay, the Lord says, oh, you're going to go to England. Or, Lord, you're going to go to Ghana. Or, you know, you get somebody who gives you a word. Well, you know, you just kind of sit on it. Or do you start studying about Ghana? Or do you get your passport? Or do you make preparations? Or you check airlines to see how much it's going to cost? That's the kind of thing God's looking for. Okay? He's looking for our faith to take action. And when he cast aside his garment and ran to Jesus... But the other thing that I thought was interesting in this story is he knew who he was. He'd heard stories. Imagine this. One of the things I saw in this teaching that really blessed me is Jesus is on his way from one place to the other. He's going his last trip through Jericho on the way to the cross. He's got the Passover ahead of him. They're on their way to Passover. But you realize that he was in the moment. He wasn't worried about next week. Or what was going to happen the next day. He was in the moment and available. And it was like the Lord was quickening in me. Are you that available to people? 
Are you in the moment? Are you distracted with all the things that you got on your mind that you have to do? But in this particular case, he was speaking to me, of course, about the pills. I have to tell you, after about a week of severe suffering, and I mean suffering, and it was no picnic whatsoever, I had it felt like a Bunsen burner inside my gut. It felt like flames of fire. I couldn't eat. For two weeks, I'd lost eight pounds in two weeks. And I was very, very sick, wasn't going much of anywhere, uh, kind of was laying low. Um, Michael could tell you it was pretty miserable. About the 10th day, well, about a week into it, I, I questioned the Lord. I said, well, in that scripture, it says immediately. <laughs> and this is what he said to me. This is what he said. He says, lest you ever forget and go back to them. And it's like, okay, I'll hang on. I don't know how this long this is going to last, but I'll hang in there. But it was pretty miserable. I wasn't sleeping well. I was really sick. And um, as all that stuff was leaving my system, it was not a, a fun thing to go through. But anyway, uh, by about the 10th day, Michael said, I, I think you should go to the doctor. So I, I did make an appointment. I went in. And this is a caution to all of you that's hearing this message. My doctor says to me, after I explained the situation, she said, she applauded me on one hand and said, I am so proud of you getting off these pain meds. But she said, you're 10 days into it, so she says there's not much at this point I can help you with because you're almost there. And she looked it up and it said it takes a, two, a, a full two weeks to get off this particular medicine. Anyway, I was almost there, she said. But on the other hand, she said, don't you ever do that again, and don't you ever recommend that anyone ever do it. She said it could be very, very dangerous. Okay. She said, had you come to me first, I could have helped you, and there's things we can do to help you come off of those kinds of things. So that's a caution. I'm, I'm not suggesting anyone do what I did, and uh, especially when it comes to prescribed medications. So please hear me on that. But this is the way God dealt with me. And um, I'm here. It was 40 days yesterday. He gave me a scripture shortly after that when, that when I was questioning him about the media, immediately thing. He gave me this reading about Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days. And coming out of that is when, you know, after he'd gone through that testing is when he started moving in greater power. And then we started seeing the demonstration of miracles. And God assured me that I would have my 40 days in the wilderness. And so yesterday was the 40th day. Mike didn't know why I asked to preach on the 19th. So I said, can I preach on the 19th? Okay. But I knew it had to be. I knew there would be a message out of this trial that I've walked through for the church. But I didn't want to do it prematurely. I wanted to learn all the lessons that he had for me. And he gave me the 40-day deadline. So when I checked it on the calendar, it was yesterday. So that's why I told Mike weeks ago, I want to preach on the 19th. So, but anyway, after the, I'd gotten through all of that, um, let me see here. I don't want to miss this. Um, I guess that what I want to say to you today is um, just what Jesus said to um, Bartimaeus. He said to Bartimaeus, you know, this is, I, I found this out as I was trying to look up the names of Bartimaeus and Timaeus, his father. This is rare. Rarely is a name mentioned of someone he healed in the Bible. So I thought, well, this must be significant. When I looked it up, I forgot to tell you that. The name Bartimaeus means, bar, bar in the Arabic, Arab, Arabic language means uh, son. And... Um, Timaeus means um, of honor. And his father, Timaeus, means prized possession. So they, his father was well respected and loved. And Bartimaeus must have grown up his whole life as, oh, that's the son of Timaeus. So, you know, what hit me in that is, you know, I wonder if he grew up feeling like insignificant or less than, you know, a lot of times when you think, well, I'm the daughter of, you start out, I'm the daughter of Richard and LaVon Brooks. That's what I started out as. Everybody referred to me as the daughter of my parents. But then as you progress in your life, then you become known. And, of course, most people know me today as the wife of Michael Bonfatti, which I'm very proud <laughs> to be the wife of Michael Bonfatti. And for me, 
my calling, my main calling has always been as a housewife and a mother, and I'm very comfortable. I wear that well, and that's who I am. That has been a very comfortable role for me. The other side things that I've got to do in ways of ministry have been like added blessings, but I've never felt um, less than in being the, the daughter of or the wife of. But I know a lot of people who do. It's like they want to be known for who they are and of their own significance. And the reason I bring this up is because I think a lot of people still struggle with that. And I believe that this message helps people to recognize that God knows your name. He knows your address. He knows where you live. When I got that word, this, the word that was coming through this fellow was so specific. I mean, he was drawing right where I lived on the street I lived on. I mean, he knows. It was like he was hitting me that he know, He even knew the names of my little dogs. I mean, if God knows the names of my little dogs and cares about them, how much more does he care about every little hair that falls out of your head? And a lot of mine fall these days. But anyway, what I want to say to you is the same thing that Jesus said to Bartimaeus. He said, what do you want me, what do you want me to do for you? In other words, what do you want? What do you want from Jesus? You know, I took my grandson up to see um, this particular. I just got back uh, Friday. My grandson, most of you know him as well, Mario, that's in the wheelchair. And uh, I took him up to see this fellow that helped me and has helped um, Chris so much. And we were up there, and he's had two days of treatments. And he's in a wheelchair. He's been there since he was 17. He's 29 now. He was hurt in an accident. And um, if Jesus if, was to ask him, what do you want, Mari? We call him Mari because we have a Mario Sr. and a Mario Jr. So we call him Mari. If, if, if Jesus were to say, Mari, what do you want? Well, he might have said, his wheelchair is eight years old and fallen apart. He might have said, I want a new wheelchair. You know? But what do you want from Jesus? Instead of saying, I want to walk again. I, I'm paralyzed. I want to stand and I want to be healed. You know? What do you want from Jesus? What is it you're wanting? But I also want to ask you, what do you need to cast aside? Okay, to come to Jesus, what do you need to cast aside? That's the big question. And you know, the, probably the first thing that comes to your mind right now is the Holy Spirit putting his finger on it. And I hope you're like I was. Say, Lord, I want to obey you in this. But I don't know how. Help me. Help me. I want to obey you in this, but help me. I don't know how. I'm scared. I don't know how to make the change. But I trust you, Holy Spirit, that you're going to help me. You're going to help me do it. Perhaps I just kind of made a list here. What are the, some, some of the things that we may have to cast aside? Perhaps bad habits. Perhaps attitudes. Perhaps dependencies. How about old mindsets? How about unforgiveness? How about offenses? How about disappointments? How about unholy relationships? I want to tell you that when I came back from what started all of this for me, when I came back from that a year ago with the conference, I came back. I've been kind of in spiritual revival for a number of years now, but when I came back from that conference, I just wanted more and more and more. I knew there was more. You know, I'm not satisfied with what I see. You know, we should see ordinary Christianity should be miracles following the preaching of a word. We should see things happening in our congregation. And I'm not satisfied. I'm pressing in. I want more. I want more. I want more. There is more. That should be ordinary Christianity. That should be happening in America, not just in third world countries. I've seen it in third world countries, but I haven't seen it here with the, the, uh, like the miracles we see in the Bible. So I've been crying out for God for more, more, more. And this spiritual hungry, hungry and thirsting within my soul is what's drawn me into this place of saying, Lord, I'll pay any price. Just tell me, what's the price? What do we have to do? What are you asking of us as a body of, of, of Christ? What are you asking? What is it you're wanting from us? And he said, cast them aside. Cast it aside. Anything that stands in the way. And it's, you know, it's not to do, um, I'm not asking you to nitpick yourself to death. That's not what I'm asking you. I'm asking you 
to let the Holy Spirit put his finger on it. And when he does, don't harden your heart. Don't ignore it. I have a feeling there's probably every one of you that something he's put his finger on today. I really believe that. But he wants to reveal to you your significance and your purpose. He wants to demonstrate in your life what's possible when we walk in communion with him and in covenant with him. And we say yes to him. And we say, I only want to obey you, Lord. I don't, you know, nothing is more important than obedience to him. Do you know, it really doesn't matter what man thinks of you. It only matters what God thinks of you. It's only his opinion that really matters. We spend most of our life over-concerned about what someone says about us or someone thinks about us or how someone views us. And, you know, it's, it's only what's on the inside of your heart, and that's what God reveals, and it comes out. But one of the things Bartimaeus did is one of the, I was doing some studying yesterday as I was getting ready to make my notes, and uh, one of the things that one of the writers said, you know, perhaps Bartimaeus, it says he followed Jesus after he was healed. You know, maybe he followed him all the way into Jerusalem with the rest of the disciples, and, you know, he was gathering crowds all along the way. Maybe he was standing there at the cross when he died. Maybe he went into Galilee with them and saw him ascend to heaven. How far do you want to follow Jesus? Do you want to be willing to do the death so that you can experience the resurrection? That whole principle is available to us in our lives if we're will willing to obey. So I su would suggest today that if there's something in your life that he's put his finger on, say yes. Say yes. Can I pray for you? Let's all bow our heads. Father, we're so grateful for your word. Every morning, when I get my Bible out, I kiss it because I love it so much. It's the most treasured possession I own is my Bible because his words are truth and life, and they give life, and they give liberty. And Father, I thank you so much for how I can't thank you enough for delivering me from these pain meds for all these years. Thank you for my healing. Thank you. Thank you that I can stand here, deliver this without pain in my body, with no pain meds. Father, you are an awesome God. And Father, I know my brothers and sisters have needs. Some of them I know personally because I'm praying for them. Some of, the, some of them are physical, just like my Bartimaeus. Others I'm, I may not know, but Father, you know. Holy Spirit, thank you that you're such a gentleman. You don't come to hit us with a hammer. You don't come to condemn us. You come to draw us into the presence of the Lord. You come to reveal something that's hindering us from coming into a, a greater reality of Jesus in our lives. And Father, I just pray that if you've put your finger on my brothers and sisters' hearts in any particular area, I pray by the Holy Spirit you will enable them to stick to their, yes, Lord, I'll let you take that. Yes, Lord, I'll make that change. But Father, again, I acknowledge that it takes courage and it takes the working of the Holy Spirit for us to obey. And so, Father, I just pray that whatever that may be, that you'll pour out tremendous grace on each one of my brothers and sisters and cause them to be able to gain the victory just as I've done. And I thank you, Father. Thank you, thank you for all you've done in Jesus' name. Amen. What a beautiful thing you've done to share with us this way today. And dear ones, as I was listening and hearing this testimony, I was interpreting in my own spirit 
the, the act of taking this garment off, wasn't that awesome? Because it was his livelihood. It was who he was. And he was casting his garment off to say, no, no, I'm not going to be doing that anymore. <laughs> that it's going to be different now. And when the Lord saw that he was serious enough to do an act like that, you see, he knew he came and he meant business. So that's what the Lord, I believe, is breathing to our hearts, that there's things that we'll have to say, okay, I want to take a step. And it's faith. Faith makes you take steps. Real faith makes you take steps. And why did he feel that he needed to cast that off? Well, inside of him, he knew that he needed to do something to say, listen, it's changing now. It's going to be different. And for uh, many of you, many of you have come, when you came to the Lord, you came to an altar. You know, as an evangelist, I used to have an altar call every single service as people would come and they would, they would leave everything and come and bow before the Lord to surrender it to the Lord. And that's what God is calling us to. See, the, the people of God, that's part of faith. That's what it is. To, and there's different things that he may be calling us to take and, and make change. And, you know, I, uh, I really love, Pastor Ron, what you said to me when I was in, still in the midst of my suffering and so terrible, couldn't eat in awful, constant pain all the time. And he said to me, Pastor Mike, he said, you need to just step up to that pulpit and preach someday. And he said, I know that God is going to use that to help you and break you out of, of this time. And dear ones, that day was last Sunday for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. It was last Sunday for me. You know what? Uh, we've got that on video if you want to go to our site and watch it. I've already watched it a few times. <laughs> I'll tell you what, that was some good preaching. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and uh, I recommend it to you. You should go and share it. Maybe you've got a family member, somebody that would be encouraged to hear the message and to see uh, what God has been doing. And so that's where we are. And I want us to sing this song um, it's an old song, and it starts out, All to Jesus, I Surrender. Remember that? Yes. Amen. And let's see if I can pull it up here. All right. It goes like this. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. And then I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. Amen. Let's, let's sing it together. <laughs> 